uh, as we welcome in our good friend, uh, Matt George here, host of the Locked on Kings podcast. And of course, fantastic reporter over at ABC 10. We are just days away uh, from the start of training camp, Matt. Of course, media day is on Monday. The first practice is on Tuesday. When you arrive Tuesday, what do you think your first question is going to be for Mike Brown? I have so many questions. Um, the, I mean, the, the one that's on the top of my mind is who's your starting shooting guard. That's just I'm sure I mean, that's going to go great. Please ask him that. <laughs> I'm sure Mike is is going to be happy to answer that question. I mean, the, the actions are going to speak louder than words with that one. Like who starts the first preseason game? If we get any opportunity to see scrimmages and things like that, because typically in training camp, you'll see four different teams. You'll see typically the starting five where usually last year it was black. So they wore the black jerseys, the starting five. Then the bench five wore gray. And then you had the kind of third string where blue and then red was the guys that are probably two way guys slash most likely we're going to be spending time in the G league. So um, that'll give us a kind of a good indication of at least who he's looking at initially and who's in that starting five gut feeling says it's going to be Keon Ellis. So that's, that's just uh, that's what I'm most curious about too. I've also, I, I want to know what, implementing DeMar DeRozan looks like because I'm of the belief that you're not changing what you do for DeMar. The expectation is for DeMar to come in and fit with what you do. Mm -hmm. So the Kings will definitely have to incorporate him. And I know DeMontis Sabonis made comments about at his um, basketball camp earlier this offseason, made comments about like, we have to learn how to play around DeMar. And I agree with that to some extent, especially coming from a guy like Domas, whose number one goal is to get everybody involved and try and get them the ball where they like the ball. That being said, with the DHO heavy focused offense that the Sacramento Kings have, DeMar should effortlessly slot into that. And I don't expect anybody, the, the wheel to be reinvented on the offensive end and for things to change for DeMar to feel comfortable, right? Again, it's on DeMar to come to this team and fit with what this Kings team does offensively because we know offensively this team is already already very, very good. So I guess kind of just seeing what's different about how the Kings run their offense featuring DeMar and what's the same. Mm. I, I talked about this. We talked about this uh, yesterday about like what with that offense numbers wise, what that might look like, right? Like I think somebody asked Jesse or Damon, do, do I, what do I think DeMar is going to average? And I think he'll be around 18, 19, 20 points per game. Uh, De'Aaron's average, I don't think will dip that much. I think it'll still be around 25 or so. And I always, I get to Sabonis and I wonder, my initial thought is his numbers might dip a little bit, but it feels like DeMontis Sabonis gets the numbers that he gets basically like off of the scraps or just the flow of the offense. Like he, he's not a ISO player. It's not, oh, get him his, his, his look at the elbow so he can go to work. And then that's how he gets eight points a game he gets them off you know giving goals off pick and rolls offensive rebounds things of that nature do you is it realistic in your opinion to think that DeMar DeRozan can come into this offense and everyone stays around the same average wise points per game if the Sacramento Kings are averaging 130 plus points per game then yeah <laughs> like and, and maybe they could like may, like maybe they could c go back up to that ridiculously high scoring totals every game to where everybody gets theirs i think naturally like there's only one ball and you have a, a bunch of guys that can do a lot with it which is never a bad problem to have right it, it, it's a good problem for for coach brown to to deal with and it just makes the kings multifaceted and, and they're a four or five headed monster and even some guys coming off the bench six headed monster at times offensively to where you have to kind of pick your poison which i think is going to be a primary strength of this king's offense this season that being said right you have to you have to share the rock a little bit and i do expect some numbers to dip i don't expect demar Derozan to be a 24 point per game scorer i don't i think there's a there's a good chance that De'Aaron fox's scoring totals might go up and i and i say that because of his motivations i think i, I know fox wants to win I think the more Fox scores, the more likely the Kings are to win, number one. And number two is, like we've discussed before, I think De'Aaron Fox scores more points. That puts him in, in the better running to make all NBA, which makes him eligible for the Supermax contract, which we know Fox and, and his agent, Rich Paul, and all that, that's what they're interested in. So I think there's a good chance that Fox's numbers scoring-wise do go up. 
I think DeMondis Sabonis' scoring numbers might go down because I don't expect the Kings, they, they never really draw up anything specifically for Sabonis anyway, even though he touches the ball and is involved in pretty much all of their sets. They don't draw anything up for him. And Mike Brown anyway has a very read and react style offense, right? His, his, his 0.5 rule or 0.5 is a pillar of his offense, which is in half a second, 0.5 seconds, you make a decision whether to shoot, drive, or pass the ball. Like that, that is Mike's belief. And he let, he lets this team run a very free flowing DHO, uh, make decisions on the fly style of offense. So I expect that to feed some guys on some nights and go away from other guys on some nights. I expect the numbers to drop, but not in a way that's concerning in a way that suggests this is just a all around really, really good basketball team. Technically as well, like when we talk about numbers, it's, it's not as seamless as this, but um, nobody's numbers have to dip because what DeMar might do is just take on the 22 points per game that Harrison and Herder combined for. Mm. And that, that, I mean, maybe it's not 22. And I don't well, think Herder's still on. The yeah, team. I don't think Herder will go to zero, but. Well, we have some games on our list. That... <laughs> I don't think he'll go to zero, but maybe he, he averaged uh, 10 last year. Maybe he's a six point per game score this year off the bench or something oh, like man that. i don't like that at all well i don't think he's gonna average 10 herder yeah i don't think he'll average 10 okay i think what, he is, might what is he doing if he's not averaging 10 eight. points though that's the problem like what is herder giving you if he's like, not do, scoring? do you see him like at 15 minutes a game or something or, or no less? but think about it like that i'm looking at the averages right now trey lyle's averaged seven points per game last year and okay. we think trey lyle's was really good off the bench. Like he did his job. Sometimes he'd have these games where he had 18 and others he had three, you know what I mean? Cause he's a bench player and that's what happens. Mm -hmm. If that's the nature of Kevin Herter's season based off the minutes he might get, I don't, I don't, if Kevin Herter averaged eight points per game, I don't think that necessarily means he had a bad season. Mm. If he's a bench player, like he's supposed to be a bench player for you. That's the way I'm looking at him. I got you. Matt, Matt thoughts. I, I guess shooting percentage is also extremely important too, because if he's averaging eight or nine points per game, but shooting 38 plus percent from three, meaning when he's getting his looks, he's, he's cashing in on them. Then I guess that's acceptable because that just means his volume is going down because of the players that he's playing with and the minutes that he's getting. But if Kevin Herter is a 34, 35% three point shooter and averaging eight points per game, that's when you're questioning, like, what is the purpose of having this guy on the floor? And I, I don't mean that in a like hostile or aggressive way, but like Kevin, if Kevin Herter's not scoring and shooting threes, what is he giving you? Maybe a little bit of passing. I think he's a slightly underrated passer. Doesn't really rebound the basketball. We know he struggles on the defensive end. So Kevin Herter's purpose on this Kings team, at least from what I understand, and this could be selling him short, but this is just what I've seen over the last couple seasons. Kevin Herter's purpose on this Kings team is to space the floor and knock down threes. If he's not doing that, I think Mike Brown will have a quick hook for him. And maybe that's to your point, Casey. Maybe if there are games where Herter, whether he's starting or coming off the bench, he starts the game 0 of 3 from three-point range. Maybe Mike only plays him 10 minutes that night because somebody else is rolling. Keon's playing well. You got to get more minutes to Malik Monk, who only averaged 26 minutes a game last season, which I have to remind myself of that and go, how in the world is Malik Monk not only playing 26 minutes per game? He needs to be playing more regardless of if he's starting or not. So Herter might have the quick hook if he's not playing well, and that might lead to his ultimate averages dropping. He, he's a he's a different player than this guy, and he's probably a, a better player than this guy. But I just randomly went to Minnesota. I look at Nikhil Alexander Walker. Everybody's like, he's a good little bench player. Average eight points a game. Like it, it, he's yeah. he's good. It, that's how many minutes per game did he play? He played twenty three minutes a night. Well, strangely enough, Kevin averaged twenty four last year. <laughs> that might go which down. is which is a career low. By yeah. the way, he averaged 29 the year prior, the only game where he started, I'm sorry, the only year where he started every game in a season that he played. And 29, 30, 31, 27, none of those games. He's always consistently been a starter. Uh, but there are, like looking at his last year in Atlanta, he started, he played 64 games. He started 60 of them. So that means he came off the bench for 14 of them. He's still primarily been a starter. I'm, I'm, very anxious to see if Mike makes the move to make him uh, essentially uh, an 82-game uh, bench player. 
and, and role players, an, whatever. Another another guy I'm looking at, like Andrew Nimhart for the Pacers. Mm-hmm. Good ball player. Yeah, he's nine points a game. Off the bench, 25 minutes a night. Like, I, I just don't – it could go bad. It could be all bad, like, if he's only so averaging – Kevin, last year, he averaged 25 minutes a game and 10 points per, per game. Yeah, because he was a start. It, the, the expectations of being your starting two guard and doing that and coming off the bench, I think, play a factor and – and and real and reasonably so. Like if you're getting that production off the bench, and now you've got a guy in DeMar DeRozan who's averaging close to 20. All right. I got it. Herb Matt, is just, Herb. just ask Mike if he hates Kevin. That's the <laughs> I, first question. That's the I, first question on, on Tuesday. <laughs> Do you hate Kevin Herter? I will uh kiss my career goodbye. No, I I I, I think Kevin Herter too is one of those guys where when he's on though you you it's gonna ha- you're gonna have a hard time taking him off the floor mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. because he's so valuable and so lethal as a shooter to where when he catches fire right it's like he can he can take over a game as we've seen in the past but also his presence on the floor alone is if you can make a defense hesitate for a second to help on Fox or to help on DeRozan because Kevin Herter is out there then he's a valuable asset. Because just because he, if he's on the floor, like I was thinking, okay, if Kevin Herter averaged 20 minutes a game and only eight points, I'm thinking, oh God, that doesn't feel, that doesn't feel good. That doesn't sound like he's, he's been very efficient. What else is he doing? But unlike maybe Harrison Barnes, Kevin Herter being out there has a chance to impact how the defense plays the other four guys out there with him, because you constantly have to be worried or concerned about where Kevin Herter is on the perimeter. Now that's where I'm saying though, if, defenses sag off of Kevin and say, okay, we'll, we'll let, we'll let dare Kevin Herter to beat us, right? We're not leaving Fox. We're not leaving DeRozan dare Kevin Herter to beat us. And he gets three sh- wide open threes in the first 10 minutes that he plays and bricks them. Then that's where Mike seriously has to look at his bench and look at his players and look at his rotations and go, it might be more worth it for me to go in a more defensive direction or just give more minutes to my top guys. I think it's it's definitely matchup based. But if Herter is on and when Herter is on the floor, he does have an impact outside of just scoring with how he changes how defenses cover the Kings. But there are also going to be a handful of games, if not very regularly to start, where teams are daring Herter to beat them while also attacking Herter relentlessly on defense, which is what teams did all last season and Kevin unfortunately just couldn't keep up. All right, Kevin. So that's a no to asking Mike the question. Just to just to be, just to be clear. All right, that's fine. That's fine. Obviously, so much of the I mean, the first game is what the ninth at the Golden One Center against the Golden State Warriors. Uh, I think it's October 9th. But anyways, point being, it's not far away. Mm-hmm. And I think the number one thing everybody is watching is that two guard position. You said you think Keon Ellis is starting, but you said it with a certain tone in your voice. Is that because you uh, are adamant it should be Malik Monk? I, I mean, I'm just, I'm, it's the hill I'll die on. I just believe Malik Monk is your one of your top, he was a top three player on your roster last season. At worst, he's top four at, to start this season with DeMar DeRozan coming in. Maybe Keegan will pass him and he'll become top five, but he's one of your best players, period. Like in one of your most important plays, you guys were breaking down, I think last week. If you look at some of the best games of the season, best performances of the season, Malik Monk is at the center of them. And yes, Malik Monk. Uh, oh, <laughs> we okay. Got well, a, here, we got another one. Got another one. Got Malik another. Monk goes down at the end of last season. We saw how the season ended. Now, it's not all because Malik went down, but that certainly played a, a pretty significant factor in it. Malik is very much a, a, like a, a, a vital artery to the Sacramento Kings, if there's a, a good medical way to put it. Now, mm-hmm. he can still be that vital artery coming off the bench, which is what I expect will be the case. I think Mike Brown, where Mike Brown's stubbornness comes into play is like when somebody got hurt and then Keon got the opportunity or Duarte got the opportunity ahead of, of Malik Monk. Now, Keon ended up working out, but I I guess I kind of get that if you really, truly believe that like Malik needs to be with our second unit, our second unit will not survive without Malik leading it. Where I don't subscribe to Mike Brown's way of thinking, and truth be told, this is the the honest to God biggest criticism I have of Mike Brown last season, and I already brought it up. Twenty six minutes a game for Malik Monk is unacceptable. Like it, it, he has to be playing more than that. Unless if Malik Monk starts playing thirty minutes a game, but the fine the extra four minutes he looks tired or he looks ineffective or whatever the case, then okay maybe you start to knock him down a little bit. 
but someone someone explained to me why having Malik Monk on the floor more for the Sacramento Kings is a bad thing. Explain that to me. So whether Malik is starting or coming off the bench, he needs to be playing close to 30 minutes a night. He needs to be. Maybe even over 30 minutes a night sometimes because that's how important he is. And if the reason for him not getting those minutes is because of your rotations, not how well he plays, then you have a problem because your rotations are taking priority over the best thing for your team, in my opinion. So I am of the belief that start Malik Monk or at the very least play him starter level minutes or consistent starter level minutes. If it's Keon Ellis, that's what I expect. I completely understand. Guys, I also wouldn't be shocked too if the first preseason game, Kevin Herter is starting. One last look or let's let's see mm. what it is because Kevin hasn't played basketball for a while. But hey, Kevin, it was your spot before you went down. I know we experimented with Duarte a little bit. That was a failure. We apologize about that. That was your spot. So here it is again. Prove that you can still hold on to it. That wouldn't shock me at all. I still think Keon is the favorite to be the two, the starting two. I'm not sure the timing works out for that. Sure, Matt might know be better. Or, yeah, because yeah. I, I think he gets fully cleared sometime maybe the second week of, of camp, mm -hmm. which is when that game would be played. Mm -hmm. So he, he's cleared. Kevin, you're starting. Right. I, I, I'm, I'm actually all for it. And that might kill him. Like, if he can't go, though, and Keon starts, and then Keon balls out, sorry, 100%. Kevin. <laughs> like, yep. Sorry. Yep. If Keon comes in right away, and we get yep. a small look at the new starting lineup featuring DeMar DeRozan, and Keon is locking up Steph Curry that game, or is, is doing his best job on Steph Curry, or makes Buddy Hill's life a living hell, Kevin, it doesn't matter what you're doing, buddy. Like, it's 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 too little too late, man. Your spot's gone. But if he's ready to go, it would not shock me at all if Mike says, all right, Kevin, this has been your spot. Prove that you can hold on to it. The 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 thing that I worry about with um, Kevin Herter starting, and, and I understand the argument for it, is it feels like it feels like you got two better options for the way this roster is is out. So like I, my thought would be like, why are we messing around? Mm -hmm. Like, you got two better out. Even if, if you don't think Malik Monk should be the starter, that's fine. I understand that. The guy that fits better is Keon Ellis mm -hmm. as the starter of the two. Uh, and is it does it make sense? Like, it just feels like we're just kind of pacifying. They they would be pacifying Kevin Herter when you got two better options that you'll probably eventually get to at some point. I think so, there's there's an element of the unknown to it that plays a factor too, KC. And what I mean by that is, one, it, when all three of them are on, like Kevin Hurt is the best shooter out of the three, pure shooter. And if you're looking for four, floor spacing and shooting, and you could say you are going to get the best shooting out of any of those three guys, it's Kevin Hurt you want. Like he's just, be, he's shown to be the best three-point shooter out of that group. There's the risk with Keon Ellis of defenses are going to dare him to beat them. And if Keon Ellis is shooting 34% from three-point range or something like that, he might like that. You might seriously have to consider like the spacing is not working or this is a concern. Keon's not hitting at a high enough. Uh oh. Well, that's an official. We got a man. That's George an freeze. <laughs> We've got and Matt's still talking. I have zero doubt that Matt is still talking right now. Am I now. back? Am I no, back? He's back. He's back. He's nothing, back. nothing changed for me. You guys just started looking out the window, talking to somebody else. I was like, okay, well, I'll just keep going. Well, to be clear, there's money outside the window. Give us every once in a while. What's happening outside the window take take priority. Um, yeah, unbelievable. Okay. What the hell? What, what, are you at James Ham's house right now, Matt? <laughs> Matt, Matt's never, Matt has never once frozen in the history of this show. Now we get him on at one o'clock and look at that freeze. That's just terrible. <laughs> That's just awful. That's going to be circulating the internet in about 10 seconds. That's right. You look great, Matt. That's, that's, that's <laughs> screenshots Matt, are cold, I need man. you to confirm that you are the not. Screenshots are cold. I need you to confirm you're not at James Ham's house right now. I can confirm I'm not at Ham's house. I can't confirm <laughs> that John Fisher's not messing with my internet or something. John oh, Fisher might be, or, or 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 Artie's, you know, playing video games right now. He's streaming <laughs> against somebody. <laughs> Very possible. Um, the idea of I, I and I think we talked about this when the press release went out for. Sacramento Kings forward, <laughs> Kevin Herter, that, man, if they're in a position to where Keon or Malik 
where Keon and Malik mm-hmm. start prior to Kevin being able to get to five on five, he's going to be at a, he's probably going to be at a bit of a disadvantage. I mean, you got two games against the Warriors, you know, and those games are every other day, as we outlined earlier this week, those, those preseason games are every other day. Once they start on that, that Wednesday or Thursday or whatever it is, they're, they're every other day until those, till they're over. And then we got a week till the season starts. Right. So not that Kevin can't get in to a couple of them. It's just, it's different. Mm -hmm. It's going to be different. Um, well, Matt, we got to, you, you got business to attend to, Matt. So we got to, we got to let you go. Um, but thank, I, I just assumed we weren't going to get to see you today. So I appreciate you texting me last night and, uh, making some extra time for us. Uh, Matt George locked on Kings podcast. Of course, his great work, uh, over at ABC 10. Got to ask every week, regardless of what time, where are we at this weekend, this Friday game of the week? It's a big one. Wheatland four and versus Lincoln four and the Lincoln fighting zebras were one and nine last season and started the season. zero and four. And in one off season have completely turned it around. And Wheatland hasn't won more than three games in their last, like two or three seasons. And they're four and to start too. So a really mm-hmm. kind of cool redemption story for both these teams, but it'll be at Lincoln high school. Good okay. stuff, Matt. Okay. We appreciate you. We'll come back with more of Steelo and KC here on Sacramento Sports Leader ESPN 1320. Good stuff, Matt. We appreciate that, man. Yes, sir. That's so strange. I could still see and hear you guys perfectly. Like, ne- I didn't skip a beat on hearing and seeing you guys, but I guess I think my, that's what happens with, uh, with James. Him? Yeah, I'm not. I'm not Weird. sure what. It it happens here when we when we have issues. It's like, oh, we have no idea something's going on. Then all of a sudden, the screens go black, and it's like. <laughs> Wait a second. What's going on here? Weird. Well, I do not look forward to seeing the screenshot that everybody's talking about. <laughs> Is that not, bad, huh? Not the best. <laughs> um, but that's all right. You've been initiated into the, the frozen guest club. Great. Very good. <laughs> Very good. Um, all right, my friend. Thank you again. Uh, you'll see Casey here in a little bit. You guys will see yes, each sir. other Monday. Yes, sir. Sounds good. We'll see, you, uh, we'll see you next week. Same. See you guys.